Remember back in Pokemon Red and Blue when you finally got Fly from that girl west of Celadon City and you were ready to teach HMO2 to a member of your party and who else but Charizard? I mean, Charizard's been there with you since the beginning. You picked Charmander because you love dragons and fire-breathing lizards and un unable? Okay, what about my long, blue, leviathan, flying, water-type, Gyarados? Surely he can- oh, he can't- he can't either? Okay! Well, well, who in my party can learn fly? P Pidgey. But Pidgey is one foot tall and weighs four pounds. How can it carry a ten-year-old child across the Kanto region? Are all of my childhood dreams being crushed? Is this the grim eventuality of adulthood? Health insurance, premiums, unstable job markets, inflation, Gyarados can't learn fly? No, I can't let this happen. I did not take out student loans to get a master's degree in physics just to sit idly by while we let Charizard stay on the ground. I'm putting this playground debate to rest once and for all. According to math and physics, which Pokemon should be able to learn fly and which ones shouldn't. Let's do this. Maybe I'm just putting the disc in the, in the, in the wrong place. <laughs> Okay, first of all, I'm gonna need that spreadsheet that I asked you for last week, the one with every single Pokemon and tons of their physical data and whether or not they can already learn fly in the games. Oh, you didn't do that? Oh, no, that's fine. No, I'll, I'll do it, that's okay. Hey guys, Adef from the future here. Just wanted to take a second to acknowledge the fact that my outfit is insane. I don't really know what I was thinking. I kind of just, you know, went into my closet and pulled out some stuff and said, yeah, this is interesting, this works. It wasn't until I started editing this video a couple days ago that I realized, wow, this is bad. I feel like I look like that guy from Stranger Things, that girl's older brother who like shows up to Finn Wolfhard's mom's house and is like, what's up, babe? I'm 15. Now I have some good news. Eventually it got so hot in my apartment while I was filming this video that I was forced to take the jacket off, thank God. But until then, I'm gonna put this little timer in the top left of the screen and we'll check in on it every once in a while just to see how long until the jacket comes off. Okay, a cool, calm, tons of hours later and I finally have a spreadsheet that has every single Pokemon listed and their height and their weight and whether or not they have wings and whether or not they can learn fly and in which games and tons of other relevant data. As of Scarlet and Violet, there are well over a thousand Pokemon. If we filter down just to the Pokemon that can already learn fly in the games, neglecting mega evolutions and alternate forms, we're left with a list of just 94. Join me as I take you down this very dumb rabbit hole that has completely consumed my life for the last two months. Ha <laughs> ha! Those of you who saw my video on the math behind Wind Waker speedrunning glitches will already know a good amount about vectors. In physics, we use vectors to represent quantities that have both magnitude and direction. Most often in physics, we use these vectors to describe forces. Forces will be things like pushing a block or the tension in a rope or gravity acting on a falling object. Renowned incel Isaac Newton wrote a bunch of stuff down about forces in a really old dusty book called the Philosoph... Philosoph... The Principi... The Principi... The Principi... You know what? It doesn't matter. Basically, he bottled up forces into three really nice laws of motion. Newton's second law states that all the forces acting on an object are equal to its mass times its acceleration. This means that for an object with constant mass, like, you know, a bird, the net forces acting on the object are proportional to that object's acceleration. Okay, time to check in on the jacket progress. Oh, there's a lot left. Deep breaths, guys, we can do this. The movement of every single thing in the universe, no matter how big or how small, can on some level be broken up into these so-called free body diagrams and net force equations. Let's take our newfound knowledge and apply it to something within Pokemon. Let's take Weezing. Weezing has the ability Levitate, which allows it to hover just above the ground and be unaffected by ground type attacks. Like anything on the Earth with mass, Weezing is affected by the pull of Earth's gravity. In physics, we call the acceleration due to the gravity of the planet you are on, the weight force. Since it's based on the gravity of the planet, on different planets, your weight would be different. However, no matter where you are, the weight force is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity. According to the Pokedex, Weezing weighs 9.5 kilograms. According to Earth's Pokedex, uh, which is scientists, 
The acceleration due to gravity at Earth's surface is 9.8 meters per second squared. The unit for force, fittingly, is the Newton. So if we multiply these two numbers together, we get 93.1 Newtons downwards for Weezing's weight force. For us silly, dumb, stupid humans who just walk around the Earth instead of floating around like Weezing, our weight force is opposed by the so-called normal force of the ground pushing back against us. This normal force is what prevents us from accelerating through the Earth's surface straight to the core and melting into a hot goop, never to be seen by our loved ones ever again. However, in Weezing's case, he is able to just float. So this means that there must be some kind of other force that opposes his weight force. Is it the gas coming out of him? Or maybe it's the gas in him? What about the Weezings who don't have levitate? You know what, I don't wanna know. All right, we've got forces down. Nice, that seemed pretty easy. Now it's time to look at the physics of flight. How complicated could that be? Oh no. All right, one final check in here to report that we are finally almost there. Please take that jacket off. Thank God, okay. All right, well, my job here is done. It's uh, time for me to disintegrate now. Bye bye. Okay. Let's start with the basics. For a creature or object to be able to fly, it needs to overcome its weight force, just like Weezing did to levitate. In the physics of flight, we have four primary force vectors. First, we have the weight force, which we already know about. Then we have lift, which is the force that opposes the weight force to allow objects to fly. There's thrust, like an airplane engine, causing the object to move forward. And finally, there's drag, which is the air resistance pushing back on the object as it attempts to fly. In the case of something like an airplane, some of this is fairly obvious. You know, the thrust from the airplane engines causes the airplane to move forward. But what about lift? How do you achieve that? Airplanes achieve lift via something known as Bernoulli's principle. This principle relates a fluid's speed, its height, and its pressure. Basically speaking, the faster a fluid is moving, the lower its pressure is, and vice versa. If there is ever a pressure difference in a system, the fluid quote-unquote wants to reach equilibrium in pressure. This means that the fluid in the area of high pressure will move along the path of least resistance towards the area of low pressure. Now when I say fluids, I'm talking about the physics definition of fluids, which includes both gases and liquids. Both of these things can be described using the same physical equations. In fact, when we talk about fish swimming through the sea and birds flying through the air, the equations that dictate these forms of motion are actually pretty similar. It's not even wrong to say that really a fish is just flying through a more viscous fluid or a bird is swimming through a less viscous one. So you know, science. Is it over? As the airplane picks up speed with thrust, the shape of the wing and the material it's made out of on top and below naturally causes there to be a different flow of air above and below. This causes, you guessed it, a pressure difference. Conveniently, pressure can be expressed in terms of force. It's equal to P equals F over A, or force over a given area. We can rearrange this equation by just multiplying it out to get F equals P times A, meaning that the force on an object is equal to the pressure over a given area on that object. This means that as we generate a low pressure flow above the wing and a high pressure flow beneath the wing, the air naturally wants to go from the area of high pressure to the area of low pressure, pressing into the bottom of the wing. As the plane travels down the runway going faster and faster and faster, it hits a certain sweet spot based on its weight and what material it's made of and so forth to have enough air pressure difference to generate enough lift force to take off. If you think about it, there are a lot of different forms of bird flight. Whether it be a hummingbird, or a seagull, or a crow, or a condor, all four of these birds fly via almost completely different mechanisms. Whenever a bird is gliding, like say the condor, which is a bird that flies largely via gliding because it is so massive, the physics is essentially identical to that of the airplane wing. The TLDR here is, it is hard to take off if you've got a lot of weight. Birds in general have hollow bones, very thin bone structures, and they have incredibly strong breast muscles and very low musculature anywhere else because their goal is to minimize weight and maximize efficiency. But this still raises more questions. Why do they flap their wings so much? How do they gain height while staying in place? How do hummingbirds hover? I don't really know. 
I reached out to like five or six staff ornithologists at various museums and universities, and some of them kind of got back to me, but never were willing to really do an interview. And that's fair. I'm like a weird YouTube guy and I'm emailing them. Why do birds? Can you Pokemon? If you are a PhD in ornithology, sound off in the comments. Please tell me what is going on or provide for me your contact, and I would love to get in touch and get to the bottom of this. I've probably already said like 10 or 20 inaccuracies in the last five minutes about bird flight alone, because there are so many things online that are just like, how do birds fly? <laughs> they just do, silly head, they've been doing it forever. Why do you wanna know, idiot? Stop asking questions, where do you live? What I can tell you is that broadly, the physics of flight is the same as with an airplane. That's a very broad stroke thing to say, but generally speaking, it's true. The big things that matter are wingspan and weight. We want the bird to be non-massive, so it doesn't have to overcome an incredible weight force, and we want it to have big wings in order to have a bigger surface area for those pressure systems to press up into the wing, allowing the bird to achieve lift. But this raises a difficult problem about our question, which Pokemon should be able to learn fly? Being able to learn HMO2 isn't just about being able to fly. We can see that probably plenty of bird species in the world of Pokemon should be able to fly, but HMO2 implies that once you've got the right gym badge, that that bird should not just be able to fly, but should be able to carry you, a 10-year-old child, to any destination in the country very easily. So unfortunately, it's not just the weight of the Pokémon that matters. We're gonna have to tack on the weight of our protagonist. Apparently the age of the protagonist in Pokémon varies a bit. In the original anime, Ash leaves Pallet Town when he's 10, but in the various video games it sort of jumps back and forth between like 14, 12, and so on. So for these calculations, I'm going to use 12 years old. Shockingly, a quick Google did not bring me the weight of a 12-year-old Japanese child. I can't imagine why. Certainly, that's not a thing that my FBI agent is going to be looking at me for forever. American child weight data was incredibly easy to find, which I found very troubling. But the bottom line is, we're going to estimate the weight of our 12-year-old protagonist like this. I was able to find that the average weight of a 20-year-old adult in Japan is about 128.5 pounds, and the average weight of a 20-year-old American adult is about 141.5 pounds. The average weight of an American 12-year-old is about 90 pounds, which is 41 kilograms. So if we imagine that the growth rates of American and Japanese children are relatively similar, then the ratio that compares the adult weights for Japanese people to American people should hold for their younger counterparts. I feel insane calculating this. Anyway, 128.5 divided by 141.5 gives us our ratio of 0.9081. So if we multiply 90 by 0.9081, we get 81.7 pounds. So that means that every single Pokemon on the list needs to be able to carry their own body weight plus 81.7 pounds. To be incredibly generous, Let's assume all of the Pokémon protagonists are 70 pounds. So I've cut an extra 11.7 off the top just to try to give them a fighting chance. Okay, so basically in my spreadsheet, I need two relevant pieces of information. First of all, how massive is the bird? Literally, what is its weight? And second of all, what is its wingspan? Unfortunately, the Pokédex doesn't provide us wingspan. They only provide us height. To try to make this as scientific and not as hand-wavy as possible, instead of going through the images one by one and trying to estimate the bird's wingspan based on its height, I'm just gonna say that, roughly speaking, a Pokémon's wingspan is proportional to its height, and that scales linearly with all of the Pokémon. So I went through the entire Pokedex, and I decided which Pokémon were likely to be able to fly just based on how I felt about it. In this list, I included every single Pokémon with wings, and then a bunch of other outliers we'll talk about later. I'm really trying to give Pokémon a fighting chance here. So I've got the height and weight data for the Pokémon, great, but now what do I do with that? How do I generate a force equation for the lift of a fictional creature when I can't even really do that for real birds? Here's my solution. There are tons of birds on Earth, and we have tons of data about these birds. I'm gonna catalog their heights and their weights and then compare the two. If I plot the height and weight data for a bunch of birds, I should be able to create a basically line of best fit that shows me what the ratio roughly needs to be for a creature to be able to fly. If I place a Pokemon on that chart, how close it is to that line of best fit should tell me, realistically, whether or not that creature should be able to physically fly. So now I just have to find out how to get a ton of data about a ton of real birds. All right, let me, let me turn this light on. Okay, uh, I am, I've, been, I've been searching desperately for websites that have bird data. Turns out this is harder than you'd think. 
scarcely will a Wikipedia page include all these things for one specific bird species. I have found a website, and I am c trying to collect as much as I can, but uh, this Cornell Lab of Ornithology Birds of the World website is a subscription service. There are a few birds you can look at for free. Those are the bird teasers, okay? For instance, the gray-headed fish eagle, free. You can look at him, no problem. Beautiful bird. Problem is, if I want to look at more birds than this one, I, I have to pay for it. Okay, well, against all better judgment, I paid for it. I got a 10% discount for it being my first month of being a subscriber on Birds of the World, a website I am sure to renew my subscription for for many months to come, for I just love birds so much. I'm a big bird guy. Bird boy, some have called me. Now, something this website has that's wonderful for our particular use here is that I don't want to just pick a bunch of birds that I know, because if I do that, then I'm going to wind up with very North American heavy bird stuff. But turns out that, like any good $8 a month subscription service to a bird website, this bird website has a surprise me button. Surprise me. Piliate, piliate, piliated, pileated, pileated. It's a parrot. But now, if I go to field identification, boom. We've got height and weight right here. Can I be surprised again? Red rumped bush tyrant. Bro, this is already a Pokemon. <laughs> We are looking at a Pokemon right now. I logged height and weight data from that website for over 50 birds, all of varying sizes, and I plotted them all with weight on the x-axis and height on the y-axis. Since this data is non-linear, a so-called line of best fit won't really work here, so instead we'll use something called a power series. Basically, this is a non-linear equation that the spreadsheet uses to approximate a function that can follow the moving average of the data as best as possible. Though not perfect, you can certainly begin to see a correlation here. So if I use the equation from that power series I got from that chart, and I just plug in Pokemon's weight data into the x variable, the result, the y variable, should be its expected height. Doing this process for every single Pokemon should give us an idea of which Pokemon are tall enough and thus have a wingspan big enough to be able to fly. I ran the numbers for every single Pokemon on this list, not just for its own weight, but then also for its weight plus the weight of the child. I then compared the heights of the Pokemon given by the Pokedex to the expected height needed to fly. Dividing these two numbers gives me a ratio that I can then convert into a percentage. This percentage basically tells me how likely this Pokemon is going to be able to fly. Going down the Pokedex, there are a few problems right away. Charizard can't carry a child. Or itself. Charizard can't fly. I'm really sorry, you guys. I was really hopeful that this one would work out, but it just didn't. It's not even... it's bad. It's bad. In fact, we have to travel quite a ways down the Pokedex before we get to our first even sort of viable candidate. Pidgey and Pidgeotto both don't make the mark, despite the fact that they can both learn fly. Pidgeot is our first viable candidate. Coming in at 76% of its needed height and wingspan, Pidgeot just barely doesn't make the cut. But when it reacts with Pidgeotite, Mega Pidgeot can fly. It now has a value of 103%, meaning it definitely can fly. But can it carry a child? No, still no. It's 13% shy of being able to carry a child. Shoot. Okay, next up. You may be disappointed to know that we have to go another 112 Pokedex entries deep before we find our next viable Pokemon. And I am so excited to report that it is Gyarados. Gyarados sits comfortably at 180% of its expected height, or in this case, length, to be able to fly. This is amazing. One problem. My calculations are based on the assumption that a Pokemon has wings. Gyarados doesn't have wings, really, at all. I'm not really sure what to do with Gyarados, so we'll just set it aside for now, but I'm gonna give you a little spoiler here and tell you that things do not look good for the next stretch of Pokedex. Next up, Zatu. Okay, so not Crobat, not Aerodactyl, none of the legendary birds, none of those guys. Okay, but Zatu. But Zatu can fly. Okay, sure. Zatu is at 106% of its expected height, meaning that it can fly. Can it carry a kid, though? Nope. So ultimately, no go. Our list is still just... Gyarados. Great. Shocking no one, we get to the end of the Johto decks before Lugia and Ho-Oh are up to bat, and both of them are good to go. 
We now jump more than 130 slots down the Pokedex again, all the way sweeping across Hoenn, which is apparently a depraved land where no birds can actually fly, and we wind up at Rayquaza, or Rayquaza, or however you want to pronounce it. Rayquaza passes with flying colors, literally being over 200% of its necessary value. But we have another Gyarados situation here, because uh, Rayquaza is a noodle. It doesn't have wings, just like Gyarados, but I don't know. It's a magical space dragon. Grow up. It can fly. We then skip all of Sinnoh and go straight to Giratina, which can only fly in its origin form, but can carry a child, so that's a win. Next up is, surprisingly, Sigilyph. This Gen 5 inclusion is our first non-legendary since Zatu to be able to fly, which is nice. But unfortunately, though I think is good news to every child in the world, it can't carry a person. Thank God. Therian form Thunderous is next, which just... Sure, it doesn't have- it's on all four, I don't know. Yveltal comfortably makes the list, and then we jump straight to the Alola region. We go now to reporter Adef in the field. Thank you, Adef. This is Adef reporting live from the Alola region. Bad news for all Alolan biologists. Apparently, there are no birds in our country that can actually fly. Crumbeak and Dartrix be damned, we don't have any actual birds. Oh, what's this? Breaking news! It's okay that we don't have any birds because we actually have interdimensional aliens coming out of portals left and right that can fly. This is great news for all Alolan residents. Please grab your bags, get canned food from the stores, and hunker down. You are about to be overrun by interdimensional aliens capable of flight in a country where no one can fly. Please, God, help us. Gen 8 is not so lucky with only two representatives, Dragapult and Eternatus. Eternatus makes sense, I guess. It's terrifying, and its base stat total is like a million. But Dragapult? Really? It doesn't even really have wings, and it's a ghost. But it's one of the only non-legendary, non-mega evolution, non-alternate form Pokemon on this list, and we need to take wins wherever we can get them, so we're taking it. Last on the list is the literal only rep from Generation 9, Fluttermane. Another ghost, and it cannot carry a child. I am so sad. So that brings our final count to all Pokemon that should physically be able to overcome their own weight force and fly to 17. Now if we just limit it to the Pokemon that could conceivably carry themselves and a child, and thus learn fly and, you know, fly you around the region they're from, we've got 11. And if we remove the ones who don't have wings, we're left with six. According to the laws of physics and the evolutionary trends of ornithology as we understand them, here are the Pokemon that can fly. Lugia, Ho-Oh, Origin Form Giratina, Yveltal, Lunala, and Naganadel. Woohoo! This... this doesn't feel right. Okay, what if I open up the criteria just a little bit? These are video games, after all, they aren't meant to be perfect examples of physics, right? After all, Bruxish exists, and no real-world god would ever allow this abomination to exist. So let's widen the percentage range a little bit. Instead of limiting it just to Pokémon who score a 100% or higher, let's allow any Pokémon that scores 80% or higher on the Can It Carry a Child score the ability to learn fly. This opens up the door to quite a few newcomers. We've got Mega Pidgeot, Mega Latios, Gliscor, surprisingly, Kyurem White, Drampa for some reason, Tapu Koko, and Miraidon. It just added seven? So that brings our total list, out of over a thousand Pokemon, to 13. Wait, there's something I haven't mentioned yet. There is a Pokemon in Generation 5 that, in the games, can learn fly, and I really didn't want to talk about it, but... He's just, it's just, you know, fine. Let's talk about. That's right. Golurk, a Pokemon that looks like this, can learn fly in the games. I, I don't know. Golurk's Pokedex entry in Pokemon Black states, it flies across the sky at mock speeds. Removing the seal on its chest makes its internal energy go out of control. Well, that's terrifying, but Golurk being able to fly in the games begs the question, are there more weird cases like this? I've made a list of Pokemon that seem like they can fly in the anime or the games or should be able to fly based on some other mechanism. I call these Pokemon the X-Factor Flyers. It's time to introduce you not just to them, but also to the most empirical scientific part of this entire video. The ADEF number. 
the ADEF number is created by multiplying together a series of scores based on a few criteria I've come up with. First, can it already learn fly? If so, we give it a multiplier of two. If not, we give it a one. Next, does it have the ability levitate? If yes, we give it a multiplier of two, and if not, it stays as a one. Even though it doesn't have wings in the technical sense, does it pass the length versus weight test from earlier when carrying a child? If so, a multiplier of four is added. Lastly, the X factor. This is the intangible. I know it's not highly scientific, but I'll only apply it in scenarios where it feels completely justified. Otherwise, it'll just be a one and won't change the number at all. If all of these integers multiply together to give a number of eight or higher, it's a pass and should absolutely be able to learn fly. Now, let's move down the list of potential X-Factor flyers. You can pause the video now and look at my entire list of X-Factor flyers and whether they pass or fail, but I'll spare you having to listen to me narrating every single one, so I'll just give you the big highlights. First of all, Weezing is a pass with a score of 8 thanks to Levitate and passing the weight test. I guess it's gas is gaseous enough. Gyarados is a pass because we all agree Gyarados should fly. So based on the court of public opinion and the fact that in Legends Arceus you can literally watch Gyarados fly, I'm going to give this one an X-Factor score of 1,000, giving it a final score of 8,000, which is the second highest in the list, right behind Arceus, which has a pass of infinity because it is God. Up next, passing is Rayquaza. This one surprises nobody. Latios and Latias both pass. They're using jet propulsion, and that seems plenty good to me. I gave every legendary Pokemon an X-Factor score of 2, just based on the principle that they're legendary. But I've given Genesect an X-Factor of 4, just because, you know, it has a jetpack. Celesteela frighteningly passes with flying colors at a score of 16. And our final entrant, rounding out the entire national Pokedex, is Eternatus, with a score of 8. So if we add our list of 9 X-Factor Flyers onto the existing list of 13 Pokémon that can learn Fly, that brings our final count to 22. That's right, out of all the Pokémon with wings and those that don't have wings, only 22 should be allowed to fly and carry a person. I think ultimately most of the mid to small size Pokemon that have wings in these games probably should be able to fly. The Pokedex number probably isn't a perfect estimation of how big they are. After all, in games like Pokemon Go and the more recent entries in the series, you can get Pokemon of varying sizes. Like you could get a massive Pidgey or a really tiny Charizard. So I think there's a lot of variability and a good case that most Pokemon with wings should be able to fly. Whether or not they should be able to carry a person, though, I think pretty definitively the answer for almost all of them is no, absolutely not, oh my god, you will die. Thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing. These videos take hundreds of hours to make, from research to shooting and editing, and I do everything by myself. I'd love to make more stuff like this, and the bigger this channel gets, the more realistic that becomes. Thank you so much, and see you next time.